Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I welcome each of you here tonight. I'll call this meeting to order. And if you'll stand, uh, Councilman Green will have our invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us each day, especially the blessing of this beautiful city. We ask that you be with those who are less fortunate, sick, bereaved. Put your comforting arms around them and, and give them rest. We ask that you be with our troops overseas, bring them home safely. And if we may, dear Lord, we ask humbly that you be with us tonight and help us in our deliberations to do what is best for the city. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, buddy. <clears throat> Next item on our agenda is a special presentation, <coughs> Mr. Wheeler. Yes, man, I don't believe any of the persons that we invited are here, so we can we can move on. Okay. This evening. All righty. Move on to audience for visitors. If there's anyone in the audience who would like to address council at this time on any issue, we'd like to hear from you at this time. I don't think there are any, so we will move on to the approval of our minutes, two sessions. We take those individually, please. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt the minutes to the regular session January 10th, 2011. Second. Okay, motion made and second. We adopt those minutes from January the 10th, 2011. Any concerns, comments, corrections, additions? If not, Ms. Wiggins, please. Councilman Southall. Aye. Councilman Freeman. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. Councilman Creeper. Aye. Vice Mayor Hunt. Aye. And Mayor Helson. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by vote is seven to zero. And thank you, Judy. And the work session, please. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt the minutes of the work session of January 10th, 2011. Okay. Second. All right. Motion made and second. We adopt the work session minutes as well. Any concerns, comments regarding those? If not, Judy, please. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. Vice Mayor Hunt. Aye. Councilman Southall. Aye. Councilman Krieger. Aye. Councilman Free Freeman. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. And Mayor Helsley. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of 7 to 0. Okay, thank you, Judy. Move on to item F. It's a public hearing, pre budget public hearing. Randy, any comments before we. The open purpose public of hearing? the hearing is just to give the public an opportunity to express their thoughts on our budgetary priorities as, as I move forward to prepare my budget recommendations to you and to, as part of your deliberative process as, as, you, uh, as you think about that and move towards approval of the budget in a couple of months. Okay. Any, qu any comments by council before we open the public hearing? Okay. If not, then we will open the public hearing and ask if there's anyone in the audience that would like to uh, address council regarding uh, the 2011-2012 budget. Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. No action tonight, we'll move on to new business. Uh, first item is a debt refinancing and use unrestricted fund balance ordinance authorizing the issuance of up to $10 million principal amount of general obligation refunding bonds of the city of Pocosa, Virginia, providing for the form details and payment thereof. Mr. Wheeler. Mr. Mayor, as you will recall from our last uh, discussion on the budget two weeks ago, uh, we were going to be working with our financial advisor, David Rose, you know, Dan Siegel is our bond counsel, uh, to see if there were any other opportunities to restructure, refund, or refinance any of our existing debt. Uh, the idea it was to see if there was an opportunity to reduce the step up we were going to see in current debt service payments and to do so in such a way that it would not increase our payments over time meaning we would, could take advantage potentially of some savings uh, in the short term without costing the public any more money in the long term. Mr. Rose and his team did that they're here to discuss that this evening uh, if you find this something that, uh, that is favorable we need uh, action on that this evening and that they negotiated a pr private placement which has a short window of acceptance. Mr. Rose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, Wheeler. I'm going to wait one second as uh, Mr. Siegel from Sands Anderson hands out our presentation for everyone. Get in. <clears throat> 
I will say, as, uh, as, as Dan's handing this out, um, Happy New Year and pleasure to be back. Um, as uh, last time I was here, I indicated that we like to come back if we have things like this because it means the city is saving money, and that's what we have in terms of an opportunity. Um, if you would then, on page one, um, rather than just uh, underscore what uh, Mr. Wheeler said, I would just cast your eyes to the middle of the page, uh, and you can see there that we took a look at all of the outstanding debt of the city, and there were three pieces of debt totaling about $9.8 million <clears throat> that currently have interest rates that are above interest rates that we can now get and lock into. Um, you may recall that one of the things we did with all these issues was to set up very <coughs> favorable call provisions. It's another way of saying that uh, in doing certain private placements that we did, uh, we made it in such a way, if possible, which it was, that we could call them in at any time if interest rates went lower. And I'm pleased to say that that's exactly what we're doing today. We're calling them in to exchange the interest rates that average about 3.75% for an interest rate that's slightly below 3%, and that's what uh, we're here to talk about. Um, with that being said, on page two, the way we did this is how we've done it in the past, is we go out and competitively look for the banking institution or institutions that will provide the city with the lowest cost of money as well as the most favorable terms and conditions. Having said that, if you go to page three, uh, we received five bona fide bids. Um, we were delighted, actually. We thought that was a very strong number. And there, shaded in yellow, is the most aggressive bid, which was done by SunTrust Bank. And this was very nice to see because in the last couple of years, SunTrust has not been as competitive as they once were, um, and they have really come back in full force so much so uh, that they actually beat the what we'll call the cover bid by almost 25 basis points or a quarter of a percent. So this is very much uh, something that we felt good about. But the other thing right below it when it says optional redemption, this is a, a loan that we can prepay at any time without penalty. And that's what put us in the position of the three previous loans that were here today. So we have an opportunity if interest rates come down or we need to do some restructuring down the road, we have the opportunity to do that again without penalty. So this was really uh, a very favorable result uh, that we hope you'll feel comfortable with. Um, page four um, is really where the rubber meets the road, um, what the total savings on this uh, actually is. And what we're talking about, just so I can make it clear, we are locking in the interest rate from now through the end of the final maturity, which is 2022. <coughs> we're not extending any maturities. We're simply exchanging, again, a high interest rate for a lower interest rate, basically almost eight-tenths of a percent. And as a result, the net savings to the city, uh, which we're recommending, taking right up front in 2012 is going to be a little bit over $350,000. Uh, that number there is 348760 but we've also had some additional savings in terms of the cost of issuance came in under what we expect. So we're looking at something actually closer to $375,000, $380,000 of savings. Um, and then the remaining years will be basically a break-even which, again, gives us the opportunity, if rates come down further, to always look at refinancing that as well. Um, in the middle of that presentation, we talk about, for a pure refinancing such as this, meeting a certain savings threshold. And that savings threshold, historically and traditionally, has been 3% present value. What we're looking at here is something in excess of that 3% present value. So again, it meets all of the various tests, if you would, that make sense to us to recommend this as a pure refinancing to go from a higher interest rate to a low interest rate. Um, page five just sort of underscores all those points. And then um, page six, as I think the mayor indicated, or perhaps I should say uh, the city manager, excuse me, um, we are here today with a short window, 
Um, and that window basically is that this rate is guaranteed and locked in um, so long as we move forward and close on the financing before Friday, uh, February 4th. Um, we see that opportunity actually to close shorter <coughs> than that if, again, it's the will of the council. Um, and Mr. Siegel, who's our legal uh, representative on behalf of the city, uh, actually puts the documents together with SunTrust Bank to make sure that those things that we're talking about indeed are bona fide and do indeed show a true savings. Uh, with that, um, I'm happy to answer um, any questions that y'all may have on this particular matter. Any questions? On this estimated savings, does this uh, <clears throat> this includes fees and everything? I'm sorry. That, that's why I think it's so going to go is higher. Totally back to the city. That's exactly. That's going to be back to the city. So we think that savings back to the city is not going to be the 350, but closer to 375, 380. That's it. That's exactly. Okay. Yes, sir. And there'll be a final ended up ending version of this that uh, the manager can, can share with you after February 4th. So that'll be a very easy thing to do. This, it, this savings probably couldn't happen at a better time. No. <laughs> I, I guess I, I, it's, it's a great effort from y'all. Like I said, you've come in here several times over the, over the several years, and you have done wonders with our, our loans. Uh, Obviously, the city's good credit rating uh, helps us to achieve those, but it's not through good credit alone and, and the work that you guys have done for us and your firm has done for us. We really appreciate it, and this couldn't come at a better time as a mayor. Well, I appreciate it, Vice Mayor. I will say that it starts with the staff because the staff started asking us to think about this several months ago, not a week or two ago. And so here we are as we're all excited about going into the holiday season and the manager's thinking about business, you know, and that's sort of been <laughs> so with the staff. And, and when you set that up, we were ready to pounce as we did in December so that we were able to capture this. Here we are basically, you know, third or fourth week in, des in January and we're ready to, to move forward with your acquiescence. So that's, again, it starts with the staff and, and, and of course, your guidance. But. It's, uh, I think it's you know. Good. I thank the staff, and I thank you all for all your work. You know, over the holidays and whatever else, it's a uh, you know, win-win-win for us. It is. And as the mayor said, it couldn't happen at a better time. So thank you all. We appreciate that. Yeah, we 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 the Bob and Teresa to... also. Yes, absolutely. The whole <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Okay. Mr. Siegel. Thank you. Uh, we're uh, no. I think I think before you you have um, that. Was passed out a copy of the ordinance yes and it's not unlike what you see in the past we structured this to comply with the sun trust bank proposal which we thought was probably favorable at this point um, and we're really set to depending on the council's um, interest um, be able to close this next week um, or be able to close it as fast as we can so that we can Start the savings immediately. So. More, sa more sandwiches. Yeah, that's right. That's good. That's right. That's good. That's right. And um, we've we've set up as as the uh, as the city attorney re um, requires th throughout. We set up as well the traditional language on dispensing the second reading um, and having the effectiveness immediately. And you may want to talk to the speak to the city manager, the kind of city attorney, about that issue just to be clear. But that's. We tried to follow what we've done in the past. But it's ready to go. Ready to go. Okay. Ready to go. Yes, sir. <clears throat> for maybe the manager can do this better now, but for the TV audience, can we just sort of summarize? We're taking three obligations that we owe at a much higher interest rate, consolidating them into this one ten million dollar package, and coming out. Uh, some ahead due to the interest rate for the same term for the same term so we're not extending debt or borrowing extra money we're just doing better with the money we've already borrowed and that is that pretty well the case that's, that's correct that's okay correct. thank you want to go ahead and make a motion with that go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well i guess so um, mr mayor sure. um, i move we adopt an ordinance authorizing the issuance of up to Ten million dollars principal amount of general obligation refunding bonds of the city of Pocosin, Virginia, and providing for the form, detail, and payment thereof. 
I'll okay. second that. All right, we have a motion made and second. Emergency measure waiver. I'm sorry. As an emergency measure. As an emergency measure. Emergency measure. Is that all right with the motion and the second? It okay. is, yes. Okay, any, any other comments, questions? If not, Judy, please. Councilwoman Crawford? Aye. Vice Mayor Hunt? Aye. Councilman Southall? Aye. Councilman Krieger? Aye. Councilman Freeman? Aye. Councilman Green? Aye. And Mayor Hill? Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by vote is 7 to 0. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank I always you appreciate much. what you do. David has one other. Yes, sir. Share with us. Yeah. Do you recall at your last meeting that we also discussed the amount of fund balance in excess of your 15% <coughs> guideline and how it might be used to attack some of our current debt load and other things and we'd ask them for to look at that and come back and respond to that as well and Mr. Right. Rose is prepared to, to discuss that. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, members of council, again, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, what we have in front of you um, is basically a, some things to just think about and start a dialogue with. Uh, page one is the background, and as uh, Mr. Wheeler said, uh, we've been asked as your financial advisor to uh, take a look at your undesignated fund balance and uh, talk a little bit about uh, where we stand and some thoughts about uh, where to go. Uh, with that being said, and for the audience, um, the city has a policy. One of the reasons why, again, we're able to do the refinancing is because you have a solid policy to make sure that when we talk about this undesignated fund balance, we're really talking about a rainy day fund. It's, uh, it's, it's there for emergencies, and I've listed a few of the points that it's there for. Um, but the bottom line is, um, the city is now, thankfully, a little overfunded, as opposed to underfunded, overfunded, uh, to the tune of about 18 percent, uh, and your policy calls for 15 percent. So it is a good problem. Um, maybe the word problem is not the right word. The opportunity is, is the word. Um, but it's one that we have to be careful about, and that's why I'm here tonight. Um, where we are is we have that rainy day fund basically today at about $4.3 million. Our policy requires, requires us to be slightly over $3.3 million. So to be exact, we're about $917,000 over our policy. And we've been asked to talk a little bit tonight about what to either do with that or how to look about uh, working with those monies. And we wanted to make sure that you kept in mind what we'll call the best practices, quote unquote, uh, for municipal local governments, uh, which you've been reading quite a bit about these days, about how local governments have not been doing these types of things. Uh, and so again, I just want to shed some light on all this. Um, on page two, I'd like to begin with a discussion of why it is important and critical to have an undesignated fund balance. Um, there is an understanding, and I realize that I'm a taxpayer as well, not here but in Richmond, as to say, well, every dollar belongs to the citizens, and we agree with that. However, every dollar that belongs to the citizens, unfortunately, the way the cash flows work for local governments, as you know, uh, we have to have certain monies in the bank at all time in order to meet payroll. It's just the way in which local governments bring monies in, they are somewhat different, as you know, than some of us that are fortunate, for example, to get paid every two weeks or every month. Uh, local governments, as you know, get paid in chunks. Uh, and sometimes the state doesn't pay us as quickly as we like, or they move things around. And at the same time, we also know that our taxpayers pay us in certain times of the year. It's not as typical, again, as most of us that perhaps see a paycheck, again, every couple of weeks or every month. As a result, the overall cash flow of the local government, paying the bills that you have to pay for heating, for lighting, for air conditioning, for personnel, is something that happens every month, <clears throat> and you can't get away from that. As a result, an undesignated fund balance, in part, is there so we make sure that we have enough money in our checking account, if you would, so we don't have to do any payday loans. We don't have to do any short-term borrowing. And that's one of the reasons why we recommend having an undesignated fund balance. 
The second reason, of course, and I think that's the one that's probably most obvious to all of us, is for emergency situations. If we have a hurricane, even though we may get money back from FEMA, it may be one or two years until we get money back. So again, rather than having to go and do short-term borrowing, which is expensive and is not covered typically by a FEMA, we turn around and say, let's have enough money in the bank so if indeed a natural disaster occurs, we have the monies there to pay out bills that otherwise we would not typically see. The third reason uh, we have an undesignated fund balance is for those unforeseen expenditures or potential revenue shortfalls. Uh, sometimes we find, especially in difficult times, that sometimes the <coughs> revenues are coming in a little slower than we expect. Expenditures may be a little higher than we expect, or maybe, again, a little bit slower, like the revenues, as I mentioned, if the state should happen to move back by a few days or a few months their quarterly payments on certain things. We as a local government need to front that. We need to be resilient. And so, again, having a fund balance that's adequate helps us through those periods without having to do, again, any short-term borrowing. The next reason is the one that I think was alluded to by one of the council members, and that is that people that are lending us money, institutions that are lending us money, such as SunTrust, take comfort in knowing that we have an adequate fund balance and we have a solid fund balance, and as a result, we get benefited by that by getting an extra special or extra beneficial interest rate like we just did. So having said that, we see that having that fund balance really does reap some rewards and that it gets us, again, a cutting edge pricing by several institutions. And then finally, when that money is sitting in the coffers of this institution in terms of uh, having the money available, we're earning interest on that money. Now, right now, we're not earning very much interest. That's just the nature of short-term interest rates. However, over time, though, you'll find that uh, if you look at previous budgets that have been done over the years for the city, when you have two, three, four, five million dollars through the, in effect, in the, in the savings account, in the checking account, whatever you want to call it, that historically has been tens of thousands of dollars that has been available to help make the general fund budget that much more palatable in any given year. So again, you get this benefit, and when you put all those things together, I just want to be sure that we realize that that money sitting there is indeed the citizens' money, but really the combination of all those factors is really helping the city operate even more cost effectively year in and year out. So it's not as if it is wasted money. To the contrary, it's very strategic monies that the city has that's allowing you to do things like the refinancing tonight. So with all of that, on page three, we have some recommendations. And one of those is that before we spend any of the excesses, our recommendations are first to ensure, as I say, adequate cash flow for day-to-day -day operations, month-to-month -month operations. That's paramount. Have to do that. Otherwise, as we say, we fall into that payday loan, which is a slippery slope and very expensive. Um, the second, again, trying to determine what on top of that is a fair and adequate number for this city with regard to unforeseen revenue shortfalls or, again, any cuts in state funding that may be temporary or may be permanent for a given year and natural disasters. So we have to be sure of that. And then finally, recognizing that over time, as revenues will increase and expenditures will increase, just the nature of, of inflation, so too will the undesignated fund balance. That 15 percent will also go up. So we want to be sure that if we do cut into that for any reason, we have to realize that next year we have to be back at 15 percent as well. We may have to then chit in some extra dollars. So we want to be careful not to do that. So with that said, on page four, what we are recommending is that to the extent that you do look at using some or all of this excess monies, the thing that we've stressed here is that it's done only 
for one-time needs, not done to balance the budget because, again, that's just a one-year masking of a problem in subsequent years, but rather it's done for those one-time years. So bottom line, what could be done, what you may want to think about is one or a combination of several things that we've listed here. And the first is thinking about creating some fiscal stability reserve. And we talked about <clears throat> that in the past, if you recall, setting up that reserve for, again, helping towards self-imposed policies that, again, <clears throat> further strengthen the credit rating of the city, which is already strong. Uh, second, towards certain capital projects that are, again, one time in nature or an equity down payment of those capital projects. Third is moving them towards maybe a more global economic development initiatives, things that <coughs> may be here now or you expect to have over time that you want to, again, earmark towards, again, certain economic development projects or project strategies. Fourth, possibly paying down some existing debt. We've looked at that over time. Uh, that is something that, again, can give us the benefit of uh, extra cash flow for a period of time. Uh, and then finally, uh, thinking about uh, a capital reserve, setting up a capital reserve to offset some future debt service that will inevitably rise for capital projects that may be down the road, whether it's a school or something like that. We know that we're going to ultimately, as all local governments do, that are viable and vibrant, there's going to be other capital needs and borrowing needs down the road. This capital reserve could be a situation where we put that money there and it's there to help us um, over time to bring on new debt but not have a spike or as much of a spike in future debt service uh, with regard to truly new money. Um, so with that said, um, we just want to be sure that what we don't use it for, and again, we've listed those things, is again to create uh, something that helps to a, a structural deficit in a given year for operating costs, salaries, uh, of the like. Um, with that, um, I would just finish up on, on page five, and I realize I'm not elected, um, and perhaps maybe some of these comments are such I wouldn't get elected, but uh, <laughs> um, what I would like to recommend is that, if possible, um, <clears throat> try to conserve this extra money in either one or several of those different purposes because, as we like to say, cash is king. As long as we have that cash sitting, whether it's in a capital reserve, whether it's in the undesignated fund balance that's over 15 percent, it always gives us flexibility for the unforeseen as opposed to just using it and then losing it, if you would, in terms of something that may come up. Uh, with that, um, again, it's not our, our purview, it's not our uh, ability to tell you exactly how to use that money. That's what the citizens had elected you for, but we do want to, again, hopefully give you some guidance here. And I think it's, it's fitting that we give you that guidance on a night when we're here to save money because, again, as I said, we're saving that money in part because when we did go out and solicit these bids, from the banking institutions, all of them wanted to see audited financials, all of them wanted to see how the city has been performing, and we're able to show them that the city has been able to meet its bills, be able to meet its financial policy guideline of 15%, and like I said, best that number. Um, I really believe uh, that had we gone below that 15%, we would not have the results in terms of the savings. We might not have some of those bids. Uh, that we do have. So with that, I'll be quiet and see if I can't answer any questions uh, from uh, the council uh, or anyone else. Okay, any questions, Mr. Rose? On uh, page four there, we had the five uh, uses. You know, were they in any kind of order or just a random order? Um, no, there really is, is no specific order. Um, I think this really is the type of thing that um, all of you can, can decide, but since you've asked me, again, no specific one thing better than the other. I, I wouldn't say no. Can I ask a question? The um, uh, bullet number two on that list and bullet number five, I think it is, the last one, very close to, to being the same. If we were, is there, if we were to take the $917,000, bring ourselves to 15%, and pay off uh, the interest, um, pay off principal on one of the notes. 
Is there uh, a way to calculate what that would mean to us as far as term of that note? Or I guess that's kind of the decision that the information that I need to make the, the decision during the budget season. Obviously, we've got a lot of pressure on, uh, on us with um, home values basically on the fall. There will be an equalization uh, factor to the budget. I'm not sure that the whole that the, the public will understand everything that there is to understand about equalization. Um, but it's really about what we spend. And if that's going to save us on the spending side, then that's money well used. If the taxpayers, if, if we can demonstrate what that would mean, does that mean five years less in a note? Because uh, we obviously have some things coming up down the line that are, that are not right in front of us now. Or does it mean actual savings in uh, can we cut back on, because we're going to make a lump sum payment, do we renegotiate a particular note for a lower payment? I think that's a very good question, Vice Mayor. Um, we can evaluate the most optimal notes, for example, I'll use the word notes, you know, debts to, to pay down. Um, one of the things that, again, we'd be careful of is taking, uh, and assuming it could be done, I'm not sure it can, uh, is taking, let's say, all of that 900000 and trying to target one particular year because then you have subsequent year, you've, you've took, taken care of that problem for one year and helped yourselves out, but again, where are you two years later or something like that? So what we would recommend, if indeed you went down that path, um, is to try as best as possible to spread those savings over, let's say, three or four or five years. With the theory being that, again, you're going to help, again, reduce the cost of government for several years, and the hope is, is that three or four or five years from now, revenues will, will pick back up again. Um, again, hopefully in, in the, just the natural cycle of things, which has been very slow, mind you, the cycle in terms of things getting better. But hopefully um, if we look at a three or four or five year horizon uh, from the time the market or the overall economy really took its hit three years ago, that might be seven or eight years later. The hope is, is that things would get better. But then there's no guarantee. <clears throat> at least you would know going in if we did that analysis and recommended that um, we could come back and, and working with staff, um, present that strategy. Um, we certainly can do that. I, I think that's, that's kind of the information that I would like, because bullet five looks like we're just saving money to pay interest. You know, if we want to use the money, I want to use it in an offensive way, <laughs> not offensive to anybody, I but I want to use it on offense, not on defense. Right, right. Proactive. Okay, I want to proactively yes. use it. And if it makes sense and we can show some savings within the budget cycle, then I think it's worth entertaining. If not, then we'll have other harder decisions to make on what to use that for. And I would again look, Vice Mayor, what we've typically done, as you know, is we'll, we'll look to the manager to, to take the, the will of the, the council, and if it is to, to take a, a hard look at uh, roughly a rounded off $900,000, then... Uh, or a subset. And don't get stuck on 900, you know, what's a subset of that look like, you know? And is it just two increments, a half a million and 900,000, or, you know, right. it doesn't have to be all or none. Right. But what's the right number or a couple different options in there? Fair enough. Other questions? All right. Mr. Rose, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Very Rose. Very well done. Council. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Move on to item two under new business, a resolution making appointments to the library advisory board. Anyone prepared with a motion and some names? Mr. Green? Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt a resolution making appointments to the library advisory board with the following names inserted. Ann Wilson from the Eastern Precinct, whose term expires January 31st, 2014. Wanda Evans for the Western Precinct, same expiration date. And Mary Lynn Schimpf for the at-large position. Okay. I'll second it. All right. We have a motion made and seconded. We adopt the resolution with those names inserted. Any concerns, comments? Hearing none. Ms. Wiggins, please. 
Councilman Southall. Aye. Councilman Freeman. Aye. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. Councilman Krieger. Aye. Vice Mayor Hunt. Aye. And Mayor Hill. Aye. And Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote of seven to zero. Thank you, Judy. Mr. Wheeler, any comments? A few, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one, just to share with the council that the bill that we discussed at your last meeting, uh, the bill that would allow the city to set a separate tax rate for building Im improvements on real property and the land itself is progressing. Worked with Senator Miller to get that drafted. Uh, spoke with Senator Miller last week before the Senate Finance Committee. We got a unanimous vote there and it has cleared the Senate and is waiting crossover. So it's going well and when it comes back up, I'll be returning to the General Assembly to speak uh, along with Senator Miller on the bill. Um, also, I put at your place a brief summary that I put together of three other bills, one of which you're aware of. Uh, but the first, and, and I would defer to uh, Councilman Green, who spoke with me earlier today, pertains to a new concept in Virginia of a defense manufacturing. So, Mr. Mr. Green, do you want to speak to this? Yes. Uh, when I was looking through the VML synopsis of bills being considered, this one kind of struck me as being something we could possibly help us uh, and it's special incentives for defense manufacturing zones and I'm assuming not knowing what the bill really says and I think Randy you've probably done more research on it uh, it's kind of like setting up an enterprise zone which we tried to do several years ago and we would never satisfy the criteria for an enterprise zone so this, <coughs> this may be something that we want to kind of watch and push if we can. I think it's a great idea. Uh, as Mr. Green said, <clears throat> we're, fortunately for us, we're never going to qualify for an enterprise zone. And I say fortunately because the things that have to be happening in your community in order to qualify are things that, that we don't want to wish on ourselves. Um, this is uh, it's more similar to a technology zone, but it's geared specifically to this portion of the defense industry and uh, in reading the bill today, that portion in the bill, which is permissive, um, seems like a really good idea to me. And so it may, you may want to consider sending a, or having me send on your behalf a letter of support to the patron. Um, as far as I know, there is no opposition of any significance to the bill in the General Assembly. And, uh, See, it's a, a big uh, turnaround from what was going on uh, three or four months ago. Because at the uh, BML convention, uh, there was talk about lowering the uh, tax rate. And the folks in Newport News were really ex upset because of the shipyard, that right. it would hurt their um, taxes an awful lot. So I don't know how the change came about, but it's a great change. Yeah, I'd like to suggest that we uh, direct Randy to write that letter to the constituents. And Absolutely. Do you have any objections to that? No objections. No. All right. The, um, Obviously, the more information we have, the better. Um, the, it's also nice to be in a position to support bills um, because there will be occasions where we're not going to support a bill and ask somebody to, to at least give our uh, explanation a listen. And I think it is helpful to speak in both directions, both favorably and, and in opposition sometimes when that's required. And with the next bill, that is one I wanted to bring to your attention. The, as you know, we're a member of VIPSA, and there's been a bill introduced by uh, Delegate Morgan from Gloucester. And this bill would change the appointment authority from the current method in which each locality appoints its member. I'm currently your member. And change that so that the governor would make appointments. We're not real sure what problem this is solving because we've always felt very good about our representation. So um, I would ask you to consider a letter in opposition to the change. It seems to be a change without a, without a, a good justification. And most of the VIPSA localities have already taken a position in opposition, and I expect that all of them, um, before we're done, will. They're meeting with Delegate Morgan today, in fact, earlier this evening. And there may be some changes to the bill, but uh, we can't see that this represents a good thing for the city of Pocosin. 
and so it asks you to consider whether or not we should convey a position in opposition to the patron. Mr. Manager, I think we ought to strongly oppose uh, anything that takes local authority and moves it to the state level, in my opinion, whatever the subject is, not a good move. And I just think we ought to strongly oppose it just based on the fact that they're taking local authority and trying to move it to Richmond. Agreed. And working with other localities, too, mm -hmm. in our opposition. I, I agree. Right. Sure. Uh, so I think what you're hearing is we want you to respond to that as well. Yeah. The last legislative item to bring to your attention and and previously, uh, Mr. Moore had brought it to your attention. There is a bill in the General Assembly, HB 1990. It's the third one summarized on the sheet. Uh, the patron for that bill is Delegate Janice from Glen Allen, Virginia. And what this, this bill does many things. Uh, it has technical corrections, other things. But the specific thing that, that talks, affects us is a consolidation of the judicial circuit the circuit courts of Newport News, Hampton, York, Pocos, and James City County and Williamsburg into a new 18th Judicial District. Um, this, as envisioned in the bill, uh, would go into effect a year from this coming July 1st. I imagine that the reason that it's taking so long is there are lots of things that they need to work out on how this would work. My suggestion, and Wayne may also want to speak to this, is that we write a letter to the patron and the affected localities and suggest that the bill be carried over <coughs> for a year so that these questions um, that Mr. Moore had indicated to you in his email could be satisfactorily worked out. Right now, we're not, again, sure what problem they're trying to solve, and we're unclear as to what logistical problems it would have, both for local governments our citizens, potentially, the, the defense bar, anybody that works through the court system. And so a recommendation to table for a year to allow it to work out allows for a vote on a piece of legislation that has been fully fleshed out as opposed to vote now and, and work it through in the next year. Alternatively, you could take a position in opposition, but I think, and Wayne may have a different opinion, but I think the biggest issue here is just there are so many unanswered questions. It's not necessarily that it's a bad thing or a good thing. Again, we're not sure what problems they're trying to solve, so we don't know how to evaluate that. Wayne, do you have a different perspective on that? No, I, mean, I, I raised with you most of the questions that I had. Uh, the one thing that's, that's in the caption of this bill where it says, and reallocates number of judges serving, all that means is that Yaw County will not get a judge. That's all that means. They, you know, they, you well know, they didn't fund the vacant judgeships. <coughs> Yaw County doesn't have a judge. And, you know, my best guess is, and it's only a guess, is that ultimately there will be the number of judges allocated to this new district will not include a judge for Yaw County. The, the downside of that is the new and used judges have one of the highest caseloads in the state because of all the asbestos cases. Uh, the, so those judges are not going to fill in any of those positions. There's only one judge sitting in James City, York, and he sits there full, I mean, James City, Williamsburg, he sits there full time. So what that means is the three judges in Hampton are the only judges that would be available to fill the vacancy in York County. And the citizens of the county are not being served under the current system. We don't have a judge. Weeks go by to get cases heard, different judges hearing different motions. It is an absolutely miscarriage of justice to the citizens of York County and Pocosa. And so, you know, if one of the ultimate goals is to reduce the number of judges serving in the 18th district so that York <clears throat> County seat stays vacant, then I am absolutely positively against it, personally. So, but, I, but I don't know that that, I don't know enough <coughs> of the details, as, as Randy said, I don't know enough of the details of what's driving this, except that the caption in the title says, reallocation number of judges created. That's the only reason you could possibly be wanting to do that. So they're not going to give us more judges when they don't have them. Yeah, quite frankly, I think Wayne has, has hit the nail right on the head. Yeah. And once again, your county and, and Pocosin are the ones that, and those folks that have cases pending uh, month after month after month after month. And it's bound to cost those folks uh, to retain lawyers. And, and uh, I guess it backs up the, the caseloads just 
Well, does that mean just Wayne? Continuously. It's not. It's, the, the cases. Th th there is not an unreasonable delay in getting the cases before the court because they're bringing in retired judges who are hearing these things. The disadvantage is most of these cases have a number of pretrial motions. So I go in with the pretrial motion, I have Judge A who comes down from where? He makes rulings. Then I come back to try the case, I have Judge B. Well, Judge B didn't participate in any of those rulings. And so what happens is the Continuous. party that lost all of those motions, they just try to redo them all over again because this judge doesn't know what happened. He doesn't have the background. So you end up giving those people two bites at the apple. You're having to be doubly prepared when you go back there, and you aren't getting a continuity of, <clears throat> of proceedings. And, and the second thing is, look, one of the critical things in any piece of litigation, you come in to talk to me because you've got a dispute. I mean, one of the things you want me to do is to give you some assessment of what is, the, what is the likelihood of this being a successful case? Well, you and I both know that every one of us thinks a little bit differently, approaches things a little bit differently. And if I know that judge, and I've been before him in the past, and I have some continuity, I can give you certainly not an answer, but I can at least tell you realistically I think this is an expectation. But I can't do that when I don't know what judge I'm going to have, when I go up there with a different judge every time. So it means that any practicing attorney is not able to give, I think, the level of advice and guidance that you would like to be able to give to your client when that's the circumstance that you're having to face. And it's just, it's just totally unfair uh, to the citizens uh, to be placed in that position. Well, there's, uh, I guess, to kind of sum up what you're saying, there's really three, three forms of government, right, in the Commonwealth and in the country. You have the executive branch in Virginia, powered by the governor. You have the executive, I mean, the legislative branch, of which our mayor will soon be joining. And then we have judicial, and we have nobody in judicial. Bottom line, we're not serving people with the light, with the rights that are guaranteed to them by being a citizen of the United States. You are uh, do the rights of having a judge sitting in your county that will impartially hear and you're right through all the cases, not a bunch of retired guys coming back and filling in. So, and they do a very good job. I have no, I have no problem with no, it. No they're, issue that they're, they're trying to do their best. I have no problem with that. They're doing a very good job in, in, a, in a very difficult circumstance. I understand. Do you see in any way that this would be an opportunity to close down the courthouse in your county? Close no, I don't think that's the case at all. Is that the case at all? No. Uh, I mean, I see it as an opportunity to not fill that vacancy. Understand that. By doing yeah. it this way. And the second, look, the second, that, that put, let's put the political aspect into it. You know, we're going to talk frankly about it. If... Under current circumstances, York County is in, the, is in the ninth judicial district. So there's York County, there's Williamsburg, James City, Charles City, New Kent, Gloucester, Matthews. They're all in the same in the ninth circuit. Well, if you, if you look at all the players within that circuit, York County is a major player in that circuit. Okay? We have our own sitting judge designated to York County the same way Williamsburg does, the same way Gloucester does. And even though they may go to some of the other jurisdictions on occasion. And looking at the caseload and what you and I will consider to be the influence of the judge within that district that, that he's part of, one of those four judges, he certainly has a level of influence and, and uh, respectability within those four judges because of the size of the county, the size of the caseload that he has relative to the other participants. You put York County Pocosin in with Eupenews, Hampton, and uh, Williamsburg, James City, I don't think York County Pocosin courts then have the same level of influence, respect that they would have, that, that they currently have in the Ninth Circuit. Because now you, you are, instead of having four judges, now you've got one in James City, you've got uh, five in Newport News and, and three in, uh, in Hampton. So all of a sudden now he's one of nine versus one of four. So I think it, it, it diminishes, 
just the level of influence that that court would have in any kind of decision-making process. And that decision-making process is a number of things, rules of court, how business is conducted, who the, who the, uh, who the chief judge is, and the chief judge, you understand, is, the, is sort of the arbitrator of all the inner judge kinds of things. And the chief judge gets to make certain appointments and things within his authority. So, you know, again, if you're one of four versus one of nine, it's, to me it's a different dynamic. All those things is why I, I'm not in favor of this bill, because nobody ever came back to the local jurisdiction and said, here's what we ought to do. Here's what we are trying to do. Here is where we are going with this legislation. They never came to the city council and proposed and asked them anything. And I haven't heard anybody else say that they did, the people that I talked to, that there's been any effort to find out what the local um, take was on this uh, proceeding. So anyway, I, 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 that's the reason why I'm against it. I didn't mean to preach, but that's the, the things that hey, I've Hey, comment. Really appreciate it, Wayne. <laughs> I take it you think we ought to oppose it rather than Absolutely. Than delay it. <laughs> Thank you. No delay. No delay. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> don't ask me for advice if you don't want the answer. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of, a, of the same opinion that we ought to just Pose flat it. oppose it. There's a, there's a few and others. And try to get your county to do it. There's a few others hidden in here. One, uh, this one... Uh, from Delegate Johnny Jano of Portsmouth on VRS funding. Oh, yeah. Um, we definitely should take opposition to that. Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a really poor statement in here. In the, in the past years, it appears that Jano has put the blame on localities for the cost of retirement because of salary increases given at the local level that exceed those funded by the state. So, I mean, that's that's like saying, well, you know, they're, they're our employee, but yet we want to walk away from their retirement. And if you guys give them a raise, then you have to plus up their retirement as well. So, I mean, that's, that's really dangerous politics right there. But dangerous for our city budget because VRS funds are the ones that we control the least here. We just get the bill. So I think we need to take some opposition to that as well. Okay. All right. Back to the court one. I, w I would just like to see speak with the other localities as well and make sure that they're um, because it's, the problem with the courts is that something does need to be done. So if if rather than opposing it, well, I suppose if we oppose it, they would start on something different the next year. But I think it needs to be addressed, just not in the way they're doing it now. So I don't know whether opposing it would be a better way of handling that or saying let's put this on hold until we can fix it. Because something needs to be done. There, there aren't enough judges. Yeah, but this thing may not need fixing. It may need to be it thrown away. It may thrown right, need right. to start over. Right. So what, I don't know what would be the best way to handle that. Um, to look at it, would it be more closely looked at if it if it stays in the system, and we say or in, instruct them to look at it for a year, or would it be looked at more if we say this fails, go try again? Well, I think. And I don't know. I, th I, I think, and you know. Uh, not preaching here, but I think that the correct method for the state to do would be to fill the judgeship that was vacated. Mm -hmm. Quite simply, we're trying to fix a system that wasn't broken because we haven't appointed a judge which was Perhaps, right down yeah. their lane. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to just kind of stay simple, oppose any changes, and but we do need to mention in the letter that you do need to appoint the judge. If you want, to, if you want to address the judgeship, what you need to do is. Send a letter to our representatives, Senate, and, uh, and say, fill the position in York County with the judge. We, we want that done. We want it done this session. We understand that the budget doesn't allow it to take office until July the 1st because there's no funds for it. But you know, it, it would be a two-pronged attack, it seems like to me. Change is passed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's writing the letter. If you look, uh, Randy, at the weekly report you sent out, back on the 20th of January, uh, under finances and taxes, that's in the second page, the machinery and tools tax faces new assault that a uh, delegate from the House Finance Committee has introduced yet another measure to end local taxation of machinery and tools. Uh -huh. Now, I don't know how that goes along with the one that's being sponsored by the Senate, not to end it, but to, you know, keep it the way it is or whatever. But there seems to be a 
conflict there somewhere, and I don't know whether there's anything that's come in since your 20th memorandum that, that has killed uh, Perkins. Uh, off the top of my head, but yeah. you know, generally speaking, as you think about it, there you have the most amount of influence as a local government on your own delegation, of which we have Senator Miller at the moment. Um, there are bills like Business and Tools and BRS and others that BACO, BML, and a host of people um, are giving voice to, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't also. But then there are there are locality specific bills like the Vipsa bill and this judge uh, <coughs> ship consolidation that if we don't speak, there is nobody else to speak at the statewide level on that. So, so just be mindful that there are a host of people on some of these bigger bills, but it's the smaller ones that if we don't if we don't chime up on, uh, they're just going to assume that there's no opposition, no concern, and. And we're going to be reading about it at the other side of crossover day, scratching our head as to how this got through. I understand. I'm just pointing out where somebody from the Senate, you know, spoke about, you know, local incentives for machinery and tools. And at the same time, somebody in the House came out against it, you know, and do away with it. So I'm Not just wondering about, you know, the crossover and where it goes and where it ends up in the trash can again or, or whatever. If they both pass after crossover they'll go to the other house and likely go back to the same originating committees on the other side um, and they'll either be reconciled killed or every once in a while both passed but that is that last one is unusual for the state they actually do a, a real good job of consolidating bills but I'll be glad to look at that one once okay. again it says here that you know, his bill last year the same bill from that was defeated twice on the house floor after heavy lobbying from uh, locality. So I imagine uh, Glenn Older from Newport News and John Miller and the delegation from Newport News Hampton are up there in Richmond a lot uh, arguing against something like that he's trying to put across. Newport News specifically stands to lose closer to 10 million than 1 million mm -hmm. on that particular um, set of bills. I heard that at lunch today. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else, Randy? Um, yes, sir. Um, just a reminder, we'll have a working dinner tomorrow at 5 p.m. at the Briar Patch with the folks from CASA. And tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock at the Community Center, we're having a meeting to meet for the City Council. can hear from those persons that are directly impacted by the sidewalk project that's being uh, put forward, um, an informational infomercial for our CERT team, for those citizens that might be interested in joining our citizens emergency response team, community emergency response team. They're going to begin basic CERT training for prospective members coming up uh, beginning in March 3rd and will run seven consecutive <coughs> Thursday evenings. If you have a, an interest in that, you can contact the city manager's office, Mike Bryant in the fire and rescue department or Lisa Holloway, who is the, she is the coordinator of, of the CERT team. And then lastly, I bring this up because um, when we discussed this last, the direction to me was to uh, try to work on some further amendments to the burn ordinance, and give it several months for our LEAF um, collection program to uh, be put in place and see the effects of that and then I was to bring it back to you for further direction so uh, I'm asking now if there's direction to put this on a future future agenda okay mr. mayor I would uh, <clears throat> would like to see a just a flat just condense that thing down to like one page no burn ordinance but I don't believe I got enough votes on this council to get it passed but that would certainly be what I'd prefer. Okay. Any other comments? You never know. Well, you never know. But <laughs> you, you never know, but what I'm saying, the one thing I will say has changed since uh, uh, the, the many years that we've all sat here together and we've talked about burning leaves. The one thing I will say that has changed is now that the city is picking them up, 
which we never offered, I haven't seen the amount of burning going on that did before, which tells me that it was probably our own doing. Okay, by not offering the service, they were getting rid of him any way that they could. What I would also say is that I, would, I don't want to pass legislation just to pass legislation. I think you can agree with me on that, Gary. You know, we don't like to have rules that just to have them out there. That's true. So if we're not addressing a problem that I don't see today, it actually takes more energy to burn your leaves than it does for the city to pick them up. Uh, many hours can be spent out there attending your fire. So I think that we've been successful, and I think that I'd like to just kind of see if, just kind of set it aside and see if it'll ride and go away. Because, I, again, I don't see any way we could write the perfect ordinance not to have any burning outside. Well, I next agree you know, with you. Next thing you know, we're, we're regulating campfires and, and uh, barbecue pits. And, and I, I just, if we don't have the problem, I'd like to see us set it aside. Well, I agree with you that uh, we really reduced the amount of burning this fall. I think public works just you know, did a great job doing that. I think an ordinance would reduce the rest of them. I'd like to see us take the next step and get a vacuum portable vacuum system and do away with the plastic bags. Mm -hmm. and pick yeah. up, have a schedule for each neighborhood and pick up the leaves three times. I can support that. Um, We'll have to kind of look at that in a, as we roll into the budget season, but obviously we need what, to make the next step. But I think. You know, what what's council's pleasure on the on the ordinance at this point in time? So Randy has some direction. I'd like to set it aside. Okay. Yeah, set it aside. You okay for that. for that for now. Yeah, I, I think we don't need to make a rule unless we find a problem to solve. Okay, good enough. Well, I think we have a problem, but I think I'm so outvoted that I'm not going to push it. <laughs> I'm in the middle. Kind of with you, Carrie. Well, I, it, it would have to be a different uh, ordinance, but yeah, I'd reduce it down and make it. You know. Thank you. That's all, sir. That's all. Okay, Bud. Any comments? Yeah, I would uh, like to thank Ann Wilson, Marilyn Shrimp, and Wanda Evans for their willingness to serve on this library committee, and would encourage any other citizens to fill out applications to serve on those various boards and committees. It's great to have uh, a list of people to, to select from, and it's good to have civic involvement. And congratulations on your Thank you. Election. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm going to piggyback Tracy? on both things. He said congratulations. Um, and I know that uh, as a Republican nominee for our district, you, uh, the entire area will be well served. Thank and, you, and that's not just the 91st district, but really, I think, all of the Hampton Roads area. So congratulations, <coughs> and thank, thank you, you for being willing to do it. Um, and also to piggyback on the getting uh, citizens involved, I saw that today Vicki had updated the website with descriptions of the boards and their meeting times so that it's a lot more informative. And um, I, I think that that was well done. I know we had talked about that in the past. And I think I recall that there's a Parade of Champions. Is that tomorrow? Saturday. 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 Okay. Okay. I, I was wondering why I was in the loop. So if it's Saturday, that's good. Three o'clock, the which per, the Christmas parade route. Right. Okay. All right, and that is all. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Buddy, any comments? Yeah, I'd like to congratulate you, Gordon, on your election or your nomination, you. and I think Great. it's going to bode well for the 91st, and of course, it's going to leave a vacuum for the city. Uh, you've certainly done more than your share for the city of Pocosian, and, and we really appreciate it. But I know you'll help the 91st District a tremendous amount. And I'd like to thank Randy for uh, picking up the ball on the bill. Uh, we found out late that if they had mirrored the bill for Roanoke and Fairfax, it did the exact opposite of what we wanted. And thanks to his grabbing the ball and running with it, he was able to get it amended and be worded the way we wanted it to be. So thank you, Randy. And You're appreciate welcome, you doing that. Senator Miller played a big part in that as well. Thank you, buddy, for your kind words. Kerry? Well, just congratulate you, and I think the General Assembly is better off. Uh, we're going to miss you around here a lot, though. That's all. Okay. Frank? Echo Kerry's words, and remind people they didn't hear uh, from Tracy that uh, Saturday at 3 o'clock with Creek Road, the Prairie of Champions for 2010. 
So I hope the folks turn out uh, and watch them come down the road. That's it. Yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a really neat parade, and that they're they're honoring uh, not only the football team but the baseball team cheerleaders. Uh, I think the little guys that won the Super Bowl, uh, they'll they'll be in the parade as well, and and uh, it, it's it's going to be well done. So last night I had I had the pleasure of speaking to that banquet. Uh, uh, quite a turnout there, and quite an opportunity to be able to uh, to speak to those uh, those young champions and their coaches. So. Uh, we're very humbled to be there, um, and and Dave Callis deserves a, a lot of credit for this. You know, we've we've talked a lot, or we've talked uh, intermittently about Heritage Park, and all of you know what that's about. And I think we've explained that to the public. The problem that we've had is raising the money to to get it started. Uh, this week, Farm Fresh. Uh, uh, agreed to give us five thousand dollars actually the checks already been uh, deposited and and we're hoping that in the next week that we have another 10 and if we have that 10 then the the the, the, the dollars are there the dollars are there for this council uh, uh i hope that you folks will move forward on that project and and finish it uh thanks to uh uh buddy's uh, company there there's there's a lot of donations that will to come out of Pembroke Construction, uh, we have a few things that we need to do as a city, which the manager assures me can be done. But uh, kind of as a as not maybe the last request, but a semi-last request, um, I, I certainly hope this council move forward once that once that money is secured. Um, let me address the uh, the election just just for a second, if I could, and thank you all for your for your very uh, kind comments. Um, you know, I have not decided what the day will be when I will submit my resignation. Um, it, it has to come, and, and believe me, uh, it will be without question the hardest thing that I've ever done in my life um, to, you know, to pack it up and to walk away. Uh, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult for me. Uh, let me just say this, that in, in the 28 years that I've served, uh, if, if there is any credit uh, coming my way, then don't put it on my shoulders. You give it to the, the council members that I've served with and certainly to the staff that have been just outstanding. Um, you have been there to assist me. You have been there to help me. You have been there to tell me when I said something wrong and when I said <coughs> something right. Um, Vicki, you've been how in the world you read what I write, I'll never understand it. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, the, the staff here has just been so dedicated, and I am very, very appreciative of that. Um, you know, I will have some words to say at, at probably the next council meeting. I would like uh, uh, for this council to determine on its own uh, when the timing is right for you folks. Um, whatever the transition is going to be, it needs to be smooth and it needs to be done I think quickly uh, you have a budget uh, process that will be coming up shortly and and you don't need to be distracted with uh, you know with trying to select your new mayor and and uh, get me out the door so I'm going to try to talk with each of you tomorrow uh, all of you have told me tonight you will be available um, Randy I will certainly want to discuss it with you um, but it's, it's just something that I'm going to have to do, and again, I don't look forward to it. But let me thank this community as well. Um, I stood in awe on the 18th at the support uh, that was at Emmius Church. Uh, I uh, was the most humbling experience I think that I've ever had in my lifetime. And um, if nothing else, certainly no credit to me, but... Um, the city of Pocosin has been underestimated for a long time, and I think they they showed um, the other localities last Tuesday that don't underestimate them um, uh, in many ways. So I am so grateful for everyone that turned out. It was cold. It was nasty. Um, couldn't have been a worse day, yet they were there. And so I'm, in, I'm indebted to you as a city. And... Uh, uh, as I say, I'll have some comments to make uh, when we, when we, as a council, determine uh, when that exit benefits this council and the staff best. So, with that, we have a 
closed session. I'm sorry. Yes, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got carried away. I didn't. I didn't. You're on a roll. I'm on a roll. You're on a roll, and you deserve to be on a roll. Um, but I, I was going to tell you congratulations, but I, I kind of want to address one of the things you said. You're not packing it in, uh, and this city is not losing a very fine representative. We're just uh, represented at a place and at a time where we need it the most in the, at the state level. Uh, the state government, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that I, I ride them pretty hard. You know, it's, it's like, you know, you're, you're not doing your, your duty. But they've got a person that's coming up there that knows what the duty is, uh, that believes in government, and that will represent us well. And as best I can tell, joy is not moving from Pocosin Avenue. Absolutely not. So, <laughs> so while you will be representing us well in Richmond, you will still be a member of this community. And uh, so I don't really call it packing it in and, and running away. We still know where to find you. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. Uh, I appreciate it. No problem. That's fine. Okay. We do have a closed session that we need to go to. And if someone will move in that direction and read the uh, paragraph beneath it, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, I move that we convene a closed session pursuant to sections <clears throat> 2.23711A3 and A7 of the Code of Virginia 1950 <clears throat> as amended to discuss the disposition of publicly held real property, i.e. Messick Point, and for consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual litigation, Martin versus BZA. Thank you, sir. Second. second. Okay, motion made second. We'll go closed session. Ms. Wiggins, please. Councilman Green. Aye. Councilman Freeman. Aye. Councilman Krieger. Aye. Councilman Southall. Aye. Vice Mayor Hunt. Aye. Councilwoman Crawford. Aye. And Mayor Hunt. Aye. Mr. Mayor, the motion carried by a vote is 7-0. Okay, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Bob.